Uh, here in this fourth lesson on structural geology, we're going to talk about joints and veins. It'll be kind of an introduction to morphology and terminology. And this is a brittle deformation type. And uh, of course you remember joints are natural fractures along which no shear displacement has taken place. So the rock breaks but does not move relative to each other along the fracture plane that develops. And veins of course are filled with a mineral precipitate from water solution as water travels through these fracture areas. areas. And we're going to talk about the morphology and the things that you're going to see in relation to uh, joints and joint characteristics. But it's important to keep in mind the interpretations of exactly how these form and exactly why and under what circumstances are kind of up for grabs. There's a lot of debate in the field about it. So this is something we want to keep our minds open about because even though we can talk a lot about a lot of details, there are no absolute answers yet. So I think a helpful way to start this conversation is to talk about plumose structures. This is a structure you often see in association with jointing. It's something that occurs on the fracture planes or fracture faces of joints and it represents the propagation of stress along the joint as it forms. So this is, like we said, joints are formed by tensile stress which is a mode 1 loading. And we talked about mode 2 and mode 3 are our two modes of shear loading. Um, and these structures, the reason why they form these plumose structures is because no rock is completely homogeneous and the forces on it are not isotropic. Remember we said the same in every direction. Uh, and in real rock that is heterogeneous and that is non-isotropic or anisotropic, we're going to see irregularities. See, ideally, if it was perfectly homogeneous, a rock would fracture in a, a perfect planar surface, and you wouldn't see any roughness or any of these plumose structures on it. So we want to talk about how we read the heterogeneous in the rock by the plumose structures. First of all, we have our origin. And that is going to look like a little dimple, and it represents, like you might expect, the place where the joint began to propagate, that first break in the rock. And remember, we said that these weaknesses that create uh, our joints are usually associated with imperfections in the rock and with our Griffith cracks. Now, right outside of your origin, you have a little mirror zone, and it's a very smooth zone because right there, when the, the stress is high, you're going to get something close to a planar surface. But then as you move out, we call this the mist zone, and it becomes less smooth. You start to see a roughness, and this represents the um, fracture face becoming imperfect because as the stress travels along the material, it experiences little differences in the strength and in the um, composition of the rock, which cause the stress field to move a little bit in response to that. Um, and all of this here, the main body of our pluma structure, which is usually kind of feather shaped, and we'll see in a second that there are different ways that these can look. We call this the hackle zone. It's very rough, and it's not as apparent as we draw it in this cartoon. You need to Google some actual pictures of it. Obviously, we sort of highlight the uh, characteristics of it here so that we can have a better understanding, but it's um, a little less easy to read when you're looking at a real rock. But this zone, you have all these little barbs that curl off of it and they represent sort of curl offs of the stress in relation to those imperfections and the acute angles that they create with the plume axis are going to point back towards the origin. You see here we can show the propagation direction. This is the axis that is propagating and so we can get an idea of what the structures on our uh, pluma structure are called. And then if we look here we can see that there's a couple different kinds of ways that it can look. Your whole axis can be wavy, representing, again, the unique heterogeneous uh, properties of this particular material. Here you can see what we call arrest lines, and arrest lines represent a place where the stress is eased off, and then here it builds up again and the fracture propagates some more. Many times we'll see arrest lines in a material because it takes a certain amount of stress to achieve this and then a little bit of stress is relieved when there's a break in the rock. But stress is usually accumulating and so at some time, whether very near in the future or later on, it's reactivated and it keeps on propagating. We call this a cycle. 
uh, because, well, that's kind of self-explanatory. And um, next, after we've talked about, that's the surface morphology, remember, of the fracture planes along joints, and it helps you to read the historical stress fields that existed when those joints formed. So you can begin to build an interpretation of what was happening in this formation when it happened. Next, we talk about some terminology that we use to refer to joint sets and systems. And basically, joint sets are um, joints that behave in a similar way, are parallel or subparallel, and have a relation to each other that is quantifiable. And joint systems are made up of two or more joint sets that have some quantifiable relationship to each other, some geometrical relationship. For instance, we have a set here that is sort of uh, vertical in this picture, and then we have a horizontal set, and together they make up what we call an orthogonal joint system. Now here is another joint system, but it's not orthogonal. You have one set that's moving at an angle this way, and you have another set that's placed at an angle this way, and we call those conjugate joints systems. And uh, we can talk about master joints, which are ones that move all the way through the bed, and little cross joints that terminate in these master joints. See how they don't cross them? Um, that's because the master joint uh, um, acts as a free surface, and these little cross joints are not able to propagate across them. And we'll talk about that later when we talk about cross-cutting relationships of joints. And then we talk about systematic joints. Systematic joints make up a set because they have a sort of regular spacing and they're subparallel. See how this space is roughly the same as this space, it's roughly the same as the space between these different uh, joints, and they have sort of a subparallel arrangement in the bed, so that's systematic. And then these non systematic joints, see the systematic ones tend to be planar. Non-systematic ones tend to be non-planar. They don't have those regular parallel or subparallel relationships or those spacing relationships. And you often see that they will terminate in larger joints. And this is just terminology again, so that later when we talk about morphology and interpretation, we're all using the same terms. Unfortunately, there is some ambiguity when we use this terminology because not all authors and geologists use exactly the same terms. So it's good to be able to define what you're saying contextually. If you have a good organic understanding of it, then it won't be as important if you use the exact same words somebody else is using, as long as you have the concept down of this behavior and why it's behaving the way it is. So now that we have some of that down, we'll talk about some specific types of igneous jointing that we'll often see. Um, when you have sills and dikes that intrude in the shallow crust or come even some, I believe, that are extrusive, as they freeze, they experience a sort of cooling and a contracting that creates a tensile stress in the rock that is beginning to freeze and thus can no longer contract easily, and there's something that's called columnar jointing that develops. In a cross section, you have a very close to hexagonal look here. Sometimes they're sort of perfect hexagons, sometimes they're a little imperfect, but you have a regular spacing, and those represent the tensile stress field that exists as this cools. Typically, it's going to have its long axis that runs down these columns perpendicular to the boundaries of your intrusion. So it's going to be a horizontal axis in your dike intrusions and a vertical axis in your sill intrusions. It's going to be up and down. Um, then we have this. When you have a magmatic intrusion like a pluton that is uplifted, there's erosion around it, and it is exposed to the surface to lower pressure environments, you often see a very distinctive exfoliation. That's a jointing that is parallel to the contact or the historic contact of this pluton and the country rock around it. So it gives you the, this look of a peeling onion. And we see domes like that, for instance, in uh, East Texas. So that's just a distinctive thing you can look for generally in igneous rocks.